Okay, th thank you very much, uh, Henrietta, for inviting me here. I was asked to think of a title for this a long time ago, and I realized that the title I gave first was a little bit pretentious, so I think that is a, a little bit more appropriate because there's no way I can tell you everything about snails in half an hour. Now, first of all, one of the things people often ask me, what is the difference between a snail and a shell? Well, basically, a snail is just a gastropod mollusk. And although I may be preaching converted, mollusks, I could tell you, it come in seven different classes, of which gastropods are those which, with one or two exceptions, only have a single shell. And they are very common. They're what you see all around the garden, um, all your, nearly all the seashells. So they occur in the sea and land. But slugs come into this as well. They are just... Uh, shells without shell, if you like. And then we've got the bivalves, those with two valves. You'll often see them in uh, the sea, of course, mussels, oysters, uh, but as well as in fresh water. But there are no land bivalves anywhere. And then we have chitons, which occur under rocks in marine environments, and they have eight separate plates, called, so they're called coat of mail shells. Tusk shells, obviously named like that, again, marine, and then the cephalopods, octopus, squid, um, etc., which again are purely marine. But I'm not going to talk about those except one or two references. But for British non marine shells, which is what I'm interested in now, land and freshwater shells, we at the moment, the count, we have 231 species, although that is increasing every now and then as imports come in, and I'll be referring to that later, introductions come in. Um, 103 sh with shells, 40 slugs, 55 freshwater or brackish water ones, and 33 bivalves, as I said, only uh, in fresh water. And there are just one or two examples of them for each of the groups. Uh, one of the slugs you can see here is a curious thing. It's got a tiny little shell on its back end. Now, we started recording shells seriously, or mollusks in Britain, um, in the 90s, um, when an atlas came out, which is still a standard reference for what is around. But of course, things very soon get out of date. And I'll refer to that in a second. But it also is very useful to show even old atlases like this, which is now uh, what, 25 years nearly out of date, how things have changed. Because if we look at one particular tiny little snail, you can see here the dots are where it's been recorded in the 45 years, uh, 35 years from 1965 to 1999. The round dots, of which there are very few on here, on this particular species um, before 1965, and the crosses of which are nearly all the ones in the lower part of Britain here are fossil records only post Ice Age. And so it is quite clear that this species was very common in the South in times long gone by, but is now limited to further north. And that this is almost certainly due to changing climate during the Holocene and the warming since the Ice Age. Some of you will have seen the um, know of this, this booklet here, which came out in 2000, which is the mollusks in Oxfordshire, although I suspect it's not very widely known. And that documented um, a huge survey around the whole of Oxfordshire in two kilometre square tetrads. And numerous species were recorded. The rarest one is this one here, uh, which occurs just on the Thames, just in your border. Oops, sorry. Um, there, uh, and it is still there. I found it there, and even the current records don't show any more sites in Oxfordshire for this particular species. And then the commonest one in, that was recorded in this book then is a little round snail, which is very common on the underside of dead logs and so on, and that occurred in very nearly every single tetrad. But of course, that goes out of date as well. And an example of the limitation of these historical atlases is this particular shell, which was first described in Paynton uh, down in Devon in 1950. 
and it is interesting for all of those who are of a certain age might remember in your younger days reading a book by one man called Alex Comfort called The Joy of Sex. And he is the man who very first described this. He was a conchologist as well. So that's a little aside. But that snail, that was in 1999, as is shown in the Atlas. That's its distribution now. And you can see how that has spread throughout the country, even up into Scotland. And it's moving more and more ever. I found it in my garden. I live in the middle of Reading. Uh, one person tells me it's one of the commonest snails they find in their garden living in early. And so these atlases go out of date. They're useful as a guideline, but you certainly can't rely on them. Now, the Contrological Society that I'm uh, proud to be associated with is the main repository in the country for mollusk records. And nearly everybody who is doing any recording sends our records there and they all get automatically uploaded to the NBN. But it is quite clear that quite a lot of recording is not done to local record centers. And I shall certainly make a recommendation to our members that perhaps we consider more sending to local record centers. Um, at the moment, we've got over half a million non-marine records from Britain and Ireland. And notice this includes the whole of the island of Ireland, not just Northern Ireland. And the records, we do go out and target things. There's one rare shell called the mountain buling, Ina Montana, which occurs in ancient woodlands. And up until uh, in the 10 years, to 19, 2019, only 83 records were added to our database. A, a, one gentleman decided that it was time to look at this and asked a group of people, of which I was one, to visit all historical sites to see if it's still there. And, and I took over uh, this area of the Chilterns here, to, and I've been to all but one of the sites recorded there, observed, where it's been recorded first. And I and others have been able to add, just in one year, another 230 records. And so it, this is another example of how recording can be grossly underdone, and you've got to target species to find them. Um, in some of the sites I visited, the whole habitus has changed, it's gone. In other sites, um, this is now very common. Well, where it is, it's quite common but there are still relatively few sites. Now, when I put this together, I didn't realize that Alex Farnan was going to be talking next about the site, but here's another area where we have been involved in his um, multidiscipline survey of High Park, and he'll be talking more about this later. But I was involved in the Mollusk team who did this, and we made 13 visits over the three years of the survey. And we went to 113 locations and found 1,200 records. And when this eventually comes to publication, as we hope it will, this is the kind of thing that the Morris is going to show, where we logged every single site that we looked for mollusks and tried to cover er every area, concentrating on the ancient oaks that you'll hear about in a minute. Um, but what we've done is to record the sites where we could see the mollusks, when it was present under trees, when it was present but not under trees, and not present. And so this is one of the tiny disciplines compared to many that will be part of this um, High Park uh, Blenheim survey. Now, one of the things you're obviously interested in here is conservation and protection. And although this isn't a snail, I apologize, obviously it's a bivalve, it's a pearl mussel, but it's still a mollusk, is one of the things that our society and many others are particularly interested in because now that is an exceedingly rare snail, a shell. Um, it's been suffered, its population suffered dramatically by pearl fishermen who go along now. And it is now highly protected. Many of the sites are not disclosed publicly. But there are plenty of other ones, species, where um, protection is in place. One of them is the Roman snail, Helix pomatia. Um, and the, that's the reason that that is on, is because the restaurant trade eats it. Now, 
where it is, it is very common. And it's a chalk uh, grasslands um, in the Chilterns. I know it occurs. Chedworth Villa got into difficulties when it wanted to make an expansion a few years ago and had to get special permissions to allow it to uh, move some of these Roman snails. Um, I've looked on site in the South Downs um, where there are there in their thousands. So locally it's common, but it, the number of sites is fairly small. Um, another one is a little snail that lives in freshwater snail, um, tiny little thing, and that is in danger of extinction, the habitat loss, pollution of small waterways where it lives. And the problem with that is that it's very difficult to tell in the field from another very common, very, very similar and closely related species. And for most people, you would have to take them home and look at them under the microscope to differentiate. But by doing that, unless you have a license, you are working against the regulations. So there's a, a gray area in some of this, which I suspect applies to many disciplines, not just to mollusks. An example of the problems, uh, many of you will remember the fuss they had when they wanted to build the Newbury Bypass. This tiny little uh, snail is rare in Britain. It's quite common in East Anglia and a few other sites, but it was found in the line of the Newbury Bypass or the planned bypass. And there was a big fuss. People like Swampy, who you still uh, read about, were camped in his tree overnight to try and stop the bypass. And it is an EU protected species. And then what became the Battle of Newbury with people against these campaigners went to court and the decision was that it should be moved. And it was moved to a new site a few miles north uh, where the habitat was thought suitable. And it was a compromise to move it to a specially controlled what they called a translocation site. Now, at the time, various experts, of course, were consulted. And one of my colleagues actually wrote, relocation is not the answer to habitat loss, but merely an experiment with an unknown outcome. Friends of the Earth commented that is little more than a publicity stunt. And that proved to be the case. Because 10 years later, surveys looked at it, looked for it at the location site, absolutely no sign of it whatsoever. And what happened was that the pipes that fed the water, the snails needed on the translocation site became silted up, hence the fen dried out. And this is when the snails got into trouble and became extinct. So one of the problems of relocation, and this will apply to lots of different species, is that you've got to manage the habitats where you go. These things often won't accept the habitat you just give them. They weren't there originally because they didn't like it. Why should they suddenly like it? Fortunately, this snail is still around. If you go to thatch and reed beds, it's fairly common there. So it isn't a grossly endangered species, but the number of habitats where it is is certainly decreasing. There are other species which have gone extinct. There are a couple here that have gone extinct in prehistoric times. Uh, Discus ruderatus, which is like the one I showed you earlier, that little round snail, this was here at the early Holocene, but very soon disappeared. Another little one, which I particularly was interested in, is this one, again, very similar to other ones, which are very common now, which was common in numerous sites in southern England, just at the end of the Holocene, and then went extinct by round about 8,000. BC. At one site just down in Cornwall, just on the east side of Knives Bay, we know it existed until about 2000 because I've had them radiocarbon dated. Now, why just this one known site that had existed for another five or six thousand years is anybody's guess. Either there was some very local habitat that just suited it, or perhaps it just hasn't been recognized in other archaeological ex ex uh, excavations. But that's as it stands at the moment. But there are other recent extinctions, which is certainly much more worrying. Clearly, we can't do anything about something that happened thousands of years ago. But here's one or two examples. One is this little spire snail. These are both freshwater species. Um, 
which were first recorded in Cheshire in 2000, in, in 1900, sorry, and the last live record in Norfolk in 2010. And another little, uh, tiny little um, bivalve, again, last recorded in 2010. And whether that's pollution, have, other changes, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows the answer, but one I've been involved with was the Thames Ramshorn snail, which is a bit closer to our ground here. And this is a beautiful little thing, uh, only six meter, millimeters in size. And if you look at the NVN and Conchological Society records, it occurs throughout the Middle Thames and its tributaries, or it did historically. Now, one of the problems with the National Biodiversity Database is that you cannot tell whether these are live shells or dead shells. And certainly some of the records on NBN will be of things that may be tens, perhaps even 100 years old. You don't know. If you find them dead, you don't know when it was. You can't tell from that. But it has disappeared. The last place it was seen was in the River Pang in 2011. Uh, with, for those who know, just south of Pangbourne, off the Thames. And these are the sites where it was recorded living then. And I have looked at all these other sites very intensively. I've certainly this area here, I've walked up the stream, netting uh, the vegetation either side. I have found several dead ones. I found one that still had the horny coating, the periostracum on it. So it probably uh, lived until a year or two before, but no sign of any living ones. Other colleagues have looked in other Teb rivers in the um, Thames catchment, and it's probably gone. And that is perhaps due to pollution, but certainly in the Pang, most likely it's a signal crayfish, which is now uh, very, very common there. And as you will know, it gobbles up everything it can find. That's very sad. We are considering doing some eDNA, environmental DNA work to see if we can find it there and more surveys will be done. But I suspect this is one that we will not see living in Britain anymore. <coughs> Those are extinctions, but we're also interested in introductions to Britain as well. Uh, this little snail here, which is very common, uh, the left hand one, on sand dunes and coastal areas, uh, we know came into Britain about 2500 BC, which first recorded and probably came with uh, visitors from abroad coming by ship and it's just part of the material that came with the ships. Another one here that I'm involved with is this one here, a very similar closely allied species, which was first observed in Britain in 1975 down in Torquay um, and is now in several sites in Cornwall, South Wales and North Wales. But again, at this Gwythian site in, um, so I'm not Gwythian, in, in Newquay, I found some that I was sent to look at in an archaeological site. Um, and we've had that radiocarbon dated to the early 15th century. So it must have been around. It is still living uh, just above the archaeological site. Um, so it's been around. Now, whether it came in and then disappeared and then was reintroduced, or whether people just never observed it, I don't know. Another one is this little sandhill snail, which was, did, was observed in the 1700s and then disappeared. No more records until it was refound until the middle of the last century and is now very common over the south of England. The Roman snail we've mentioned um, was brought in by the Romans, probably by food. But what many don't know is a common garden snail was also introduced by the Romans. There are no archaeological records of it earlier than that. So that's another one. Whether they brought it for food, we don't know. But you can thank the Romans for the pests, for the snail that eats all your vegetables. There are modern introductions that we've investigated. One is this lovely little snail, which uh, it, it's similar ones are fairly common. But this one has these lovely little beads in the world. And it was first recognized in 2004 at living on the balustrade at Cliveden um, in, uh, near, near, uh, near Slough. 
what we do know, though, is that the balustrade was brought over from the Villa Borghese in Rome in 1896. So that species survived there for 108 years before anybody recognised its existence. It must have been observed, but there was just nobody interested, perhaps. Um, and th there is the picture of the same balustrade at the Villa Borghese in Rome. And there are probably others. And the only other site where this is now known is on Brown Sea Island, which again has a lot of Roman remains um, as well. Um, I've got to rush on. I've been told five minutes only to go. Slugs also introduced this one, was found in uh, Cardiff and was very first described to the world. Now, we didn't know where it came. Um, I've got examples of these um, ones, which for those who are coming to the workshop this afternoon, you will be able to see them. But a lot more uh, freshwater snail, um, shells are causing problems. It's a tiny little sideline. You may think that snails live a few years. This actual snail uh, shell here, a seashell, of which I have an example, is actually the oldest known, longest living um, non-colonial animal of any type in the world. And this one was dated to 507 years, and you can count the growth rings on it. Um, I mentioned archaeology. I'm going to skip through that one because time is running out. My interest is looking at using mollusks to look at the different landscapes because um, you go down, you excavate, you take samples, and then you extract all the mollusks. And you can divide them into the different habitats which they will live. And these are just some examples, very quickly, of the different kinds of species which occur in the different habitats. And you could, depending on the numbers you find for each, uh, you can work out the habitats. And the same applies to freshwater species as well. Lots of different species occur in different habitats. And there's one example of how useful this is, a site in Cornwall where there was a um, rock formation we thought was a wall and we took some samples above it because didn't, we didn't know whether this wall was prehistoric or modern due to mining. And if you look here at the shells, we did some dating on them and the different species at different depths down this the sort of column we took here shows that the down at the bottom we had a lot of shade loving species and then they around about 2000 BC they disappeared. So we know that in the uh, um, Bronze Age time this was wooded area or certainly with shade or long grass and then that all disappeared and became much more open country. One of my particular interests is in looking for aliens. Introductions only live in hot houses. And this started when I had a visit to Oxford Botanic Gardens and found some that I didn't recognize. And I took them home and identified them for some of these species which don't occur in the wild. Um, and I have been around now over 50 locations around Britain trying to look in every single um, open to the public glass house set up that I can find and have got these um, aliens, as we call them, in 31 of the 52 sites. So most people think I'm completely mad when I'm saying going to look for aliens. But what is important is that some of these occur in huge abundance. At Eden Project, for instance, the one that occurs in their tens of thousands. Now, if climate improves enough and our winters are warm enough, these things may get out in the wild and we have no idea what they will do. Um, and these are just some other examples of some of these um, aliens. And I'm going to finish there just to remind you that humans aren't the only snail collectors. We can get uh, the, some of the caddisflies produce these beautiful little cases covered in snails, mostly um, uh, freshwater snails, of course, but one or two occasionally will include um, land shells that have fallen into the streams. I would say just before I go, uh, those who are interested in snails, I've got some available, um, which will be out at lunchtime. If anybody wants some of these guides, which illustrates every single land snail currently known in Britain, 
Um, I've got these, they're three pounds each, and I'd love to get rid of the supply I've brought. Okay, thank you very much.